In eukaryotes, we have to look at another mechanism, and this is called alternative splicing. Now, I do not want you to confuse alternative splicing with another mechanism we describe, which is called polycystronic messages. Polycystronic messages, remember, are specific to prokaryotes. Alternative splicing now is going to be specific to eukaryotes. In alternative splicing, what we're talking about is taking a single messenger RNA molecule that's been produced from a DNA template, and that this messenger RNA molecule is going to have a number of exons associated with it, and of course a certain number of introns as well. Remember that one of the key maturation steps for messenger RNA was the capping, the polyadenylation, and finally the splicing. Now, in certain cell types, splicing can happen in different ways. So in certain cell types, you can get the splicing happening so that maybe certain exons get placed together, whereas in another cell type, the splicing happens so that other exons get placed together. And that's what we mean by alternative splicing. You know, it's kind of interesting, early on when they were first doing the Human Genome Project, they thought there was about, oh, 100,000 or so genes, according to the number of proteins that we see in our, in our bodies. Nowadays, they think there's about 20 to 25,000 genes, and the number's getting smaller every day, right? Why is it getting smaller? It's because they're finding that there's less number of different genes, but a greater number of proteins. How do you produce this diversity of proteins? It's from alternative splicing. So here's what I'm talking about. In alternative splicing, you have one single messenger RNA, and unlike polycystronic messages, you have one start and one stop codon. So the ribosome will come along, it will see that start codon, and it will stop when it sees the stop codon. But prior to it being read by the ribosome, there's going to be some splicing that happens. Now, you could have two different types of splicing variants. In variation one, perhaps you have exons one, two, and four that come together. So intron one, intron two, exon three, and intron three are all spliced out. This, this area right here and right here are gonna be completely spliced out, and what's linked together are exons one, two, and four. Maybe in another cell type, the exact same messenger RNA is spliced differently so that intron 1, exon 2, and intron 2 are spliced out in addition to intron 3. Well, in that cell type, you would see exons 1, 3, and 4 coming together. So notice, splicing variant 1 has exons 1, 2, and 4 linked together, whereas splicing variant 2 has exons 1, 3, and 4 linked together. This allows the cell to produce two different types of proteins from one single messenger RNA by sort of taking these exons. I think of each of these exons as like a, a Lego, and you could put the Legos together, different Legos together in different conformations to make a building, to make a ship, to make a monster. Okay, so by putting different exons together, you can change the eventual amino acid sequence. Where do you see this practically? Well, the board exams expect you to know that from one single heterogeneous nuclear RNA, or think of that as a pre-mRNA, you can make different um, immunoglobulins. For example, when a B cell is first produced, the immunoglobulins are all going to be membrane bound. And then as that B cell matures into a plasma cell, the, the antibodies typically are all going to be secreted from the cell. What enables the, the B cell to have to have antibodies membrane bound and then secreted? Well, it's actually the presence of hydrophilic versus hydrophobic amino acids. If that immunoglobulin in its, uh, in its FC portion has, has uh, hydrophobic amino acids, it's going to be membrane bound. If in that portion it has hydrophilic amino acids, well, then it's going to be secreted. So by splicing in such a way so that perhaps exon 2 has hydrophobic amino acids, this would be a membrane-bound immunoglobulin. If splicing happens so as to put perhaps exon 3 in, which was maybe hydrophilic amino acids, when that variant of splicing occurred, there would be hydrophilic secreted immunoglobulins. So that's just one example. 
the different tropomyosin variants within your muscle, various types of tropomyosin that's made in your muscle. There's different troponins. Uh, these are all made by differential RNA splicing. So alternative splicing, differential RNA splicing, these are terms that are used synonymously. And then finally, the various dopamine receptors in your brain. Are each of the dopamine receptors made from a separate gene? No. Actually, all the dopamine receptors are made from the same gene. What makes one dopamine receptor separate from another is actually the way in which the mRNA was spliced. So dopamine receptors in brain, tropomyosin variants in muscle, and uh, immunoglobulins, three areas commonly tested where you need to realize that alternative splicing is very much operational.